Welcome to today's webinar, uh, which is all about business turnaround. Uh, my name is Phil Scott, Director at FD Recruit. I'm delighted to be joined today by two expert panelists who will be sharing their knowledge of turning businesses round. Uh, we spent many a year turning several businesses round, um, so we'll be hearing that through the session. Just to let you know a little bit about the running order, um, I'm going to be putting a main set of questions to the, uh, to the two panelists. And um, then towards the end of the session, we'll be opening up the session for questions and answers. If anyone does want to put a, a question to either of the panelists, then if you use the chat box facility, which is at the bottom of the screen there. So just uh, to make introduction to two panelists, we'll start with Phil White. Phil's experience goes back a number of years. Um, his experience in turnaround is, is quite operational. Uh, but I'd just like to ask Phil to introduce himself. How long have you been working in turnaround and what's life like for you at the minute, Phil? Um, right, thanks, Phil. Yeah, I've been working in turnaround, I'd say, by default over more than 25 years, uh, ever since I started as an FD and I was asked to move minor mountains without causing earthquakes at Weller back in the mid 90s. So. Um, really, it's found me over that period as I uh, discovered that really I was doing more and more challenging exercises and they were defined very well as turnaround rather than me searching for it. And life's very busy at the moment. I'm doing a business integration at the moment in the Midlands and Yorkshire and might touch on that later. Thanks, Phil. And uh, James, I know we were saying before your um, angle is quite financial um, in terms of funding, etc. Um, but um, just tell us a little bit about your background, how long you've been working in turnaround and what's life like for you at the minute? Yeah, sure. So chartered accountant, also a member of the Institute for Turnaround for many years. Um, I went into restructuring in 2001 after the dot-com bubble burst and 9-11 from, uh, from the live side deal environment and doing a lot of work for private equity houses, buy side, sell side. Um, I um, uh, worked in the big four, um, uh, KPMG and Ernst & Young out of London. Um, I spent a couple of years as UK head of company side restructuring at Grant Thornton um, and, um, uh, and then uh, went back to being independent. So I spent eight or nine years of being an independent exec working as a uh, sort of right-hand man to the CEO, etc. Life today, well, um, I was on a CRO and um, a gig uh, for a UK listed company. Um, I was based out of Malaysia for about four months of, on that global business. So uh, I didn't get back out there for lockdown. <laughs> um, so it was nice to have a bit of time at home. Um, I've got an SME refinancing that's happening. Um, and I helped my partner out with a bit of um, with her estate agency business. Um, just to keep my hand in, but actively looking to get into a new gig and a couple of leads at the moment. Thanks, James. So um, we'll kick this off. Uh, I mean, obviously the subject is is turnaround, but Phil, uh, we'll go over to you. Just let, let's talk about what is a business turnaround? Right, well, I made the um, intention of not even looking up in the dictionary and just thinking about it myself. I would say any underachieving business where, where expectations are not being met and something needs to happen, which is anywhere between very significant and transformational, and really that is turnaround. And I'd say turnaround and transformation. I think it's very difficult when you become a, an owner or management of a business. You don't like to be labelled as turnaround because it sounds like you've done something wrong or you've failed. So I think we have to be quite careful uh, how we actually construct the uh, definition as not pejorative, but more any business that wants to transform itself is in some kind of turnaround position. But some, of course, can be in distress and there's no denying that. So it covers both. Thanks, Phil. And James, would you agree? What's, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. I mean, I'd start by underperformance is the key and then I think I'd sort of break it out into uh, businesses that are kind of business as usual um, and not distressed or stress distressed and uh, and a separate branch where it goes into stress distressed 
And I think then when you're in the stress, distressed, you then kind of branch into, well, is it financial issues? So is it about liquidity? Is it about your lender facilities uh, and challenges around that? Um, or, or is it more operational? Um, and to, to, to pick up what Phil's saying, you know, transformation is kind of business transformation is kind of the, the, the current language that uh, people are using. And obviously COVID is creating an environment where almost every business needs to be thinking about restructuring, transformation, change, and what are they doing on that agenda? Thanks. And, and, and we were speaking about this yesterday um, about it's not really a turnaround FD. That's not necessarily, it's wider than that. What's your, what's, what's the correct badge for, um, you know, for, for someone who's got a finance background who goes into turnaround? Well, I think it's, um, I mean, I think restructuring is the, is the key word. Um, CRO is a, a title that can be attributed to that, Chief Restructuring Officer. Um, uh, uh, and I think that's going to become in vogue again um, as, as a, a commonly used term. Um, we, we inherited that from um, the other side of the pond, from the US, the likes of Alex Partners, Alvarez and Marcel in the market over here in the UK and Europe. Uh, but um, uh, it, it, it has had, for a period of time, a bit of a stigma around it. So I think another way to kind of um, to, 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 to think of it is a, like a CFO plus or a CFO plus plus um, where you've got those hard edge cash skills, external stakeholder skills and, and really need to be a much more rounded individual in dealing with people, adversity, agendas, stakeholders. Thanks, James. And, and Phil, would you say there's a particular title or badge that, uh, that, that that you'd wear or is it a mixture of everything what's your thoughts i think often you have to actually fit in with the politics and the background of the situation of your client so and um, there'll be a lot of vested interest as to what you call because the fd or cfo won't want to feel threatened so coming in as a turnaround fd when there's already an fd there uh, can be very threatening and i think you know one has to be um aware of the politics and uh, diplomacy within you know how you um, fit in with the chemistry of the business when you're coming in and then going out so you need to be coming in and find yourself a way to get yourself welcome when everybody's going to be threatened uh, to some extent by your presence and also leaving it in good shape too so that you, you you create a continuity so i think a lot depends on how the the client wants to describe you quite honestly I think that's absolutely right um, and um, uh, for me it's about intervention and it's about bringing in um, skills in a particular area that you know a CFO or an FD that's in situ maybe just needs a bit of help you know they've not been there before they've not had those kind of challenges not through any fault of their own but you know they've not confronted workout bankers and and some of this situation um, and, uh, and often the skills don't exist around the board table because uh, people have only seen businesses kind of going in one direction. Sometimes, though, you're being brought in because there's a void on the CFO FD slot um, and, the, uh, and the, C, the, the CEO's kind of looking for you to kind of play that role. So it's all about adaptability. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, and James, um, we, we did, well, I think Phil said he, he sort of got into turnaround through default, but uh, while I've got you, James, how did you get into to turnaround? Well, I've always been interested in investment management um, and uh, trying to sort of, you know, make returns um, uh, out of the situation. I was once uh, featured in an article about using my student loan to, uh, to, to buy shares with it. <laughs> my dad read it in the coffee lounge at the university where it was a like, senior lecturer. <laughs> lecturer. One of his colleagues passed it across. He didn't know anything about it. So um, <clears throat> uh, I was looking to get into private equity um, as on, on the principal side. Um, I, I was doing TS experience and deal experience uh, and that was, that was where I was going next. Um, from PwC 
Um, basically, the dot-com bubble, 9-11, LiveSide just switched off overnight. So um, I knew a couple of people that worked at KPMG in restructuring. They loved it. Uh, I did my first project, my second project, my third project. And I loved the whole people agenda around restructuring and distress. Um, rather than being in a TS team and a deal where, you know, it's the P house's deal, if you like, and you're there to uh, almost bluntly be the due diligence and the checkbook behind if something goes wrong and there's a black hole. Okay, and uh, Phil, what, what about you? Uh, you said you got into turnaround by default. Go on, talk me through how you got into it. Yeah, as I say, I was, I was just an, an innocent FD at the time, really. But I, when I started to look back and think about all these very difficult and challenging businesses and whether that was just my luck in life, uh, it helped. I can't even remember who it was, but um, they said you've got a fantastic track, track record at turning around really difficult situations. And I, I must say, I was just thinking back, every single business I've been into, um, I've never known quite how we're going to get out of it. And it's always been worse than I was, it was dressed up to be when I came in. And the problems and the root causes were, were not necessarily what the board or the um, employer thought they were. So you've got to be ready for to adapt to those changes. And it's really built up um, a, a track record for me of being able to I've been told by many bosses and clients, I've, I, I have a, a knack of seeing things clearly and, and coming up with something, which almost makes me think of Blackadder and Baldrick when he says, think of something, Baldrick. So <laughs> probably not always in that image, but you do have to be creative and come up with solutions, which are not necessarily the ones which they had in mind when they, they, they recruited you. There's usually a problem and you need to find it and uh, a way through. And basically, I've, I've been involved in quite a lot of difficult uh, finance positions, which have ended up being turnaround in one shape or form. And how do you, how you, how do you pick up your assignments then? How, how do they come to you? Uh, mainly uh, headhunters, actually, and word of mouth. And I was just thinking back through this. It's nearly always I'm contacted. I mean, I, I do make applications like anybody else uh, does, and some of those are successful. But if I look at um, the, the, the track record has been increasingly uh, I'm contacted, uh, mainly headhunters, uh, banks occasionally. Uh, I've had repeat business as well where I've the bosses come and chase me back again and the clients I'm with at the moment uh, I was with a, a year ago doing a business integration has asked me to do another one and um, that happened again with a, another boss when he became chairman and CEO of a major distributor um, so very various ways um, but uh, networking is all important I would say Thanks, Phil. And, and James, what, what about you? How, how, how do you pick up uh, the assignment? Yeah, so early on, um, uh, it, it was mainly bank, um, bank contacts. Um, but we saw in um, uh, after the kind of financial crisis and, the, the, and this kind of second wave of, um, uh, of some of those deals coming around again, we then, we then saw a, a massive downsizing of the workout teams in the banks. Um, and uh, people moving out or going into other careers. Um, uh, so a lot of the contacts moved on. Um, obviously, some people sort of retired as well. Um, so the last um, three or four years, um, it's, uh, it's really been um, a, a lot through the accountancy firms um, uh, and um, outside, just outside of the big six as well. Um, uh, most of them have a panel or if they don't have a kind of formal sort of independent exec panel, uh, then um, it kind of operates on a kind of who you know, sort of little black book basis. So there's a bit of a range in the market around that. Um, uh, word of mouth recommendations um, uh, and a little bit of uh, private equity. Well, private equity is quite a difficult one to get into um, historically uh, because um, uh, in a private equity investment um, 
execs don't typically want to have restructuring people sort of around their portfolios because it kind of highlights the, the assets that have maybe kind of gone wrong, whereas internally they want to look like the stars and, uh, and, and focus on the two or three success stories and, and, and talk about those. But I think with COVID, we've probably got another opportunity um, of, um, of some, some reassessment in some of the, the PE and fund style um, stakeholders. Yeah, it's interesting what you say there, uh, James, because uh, you would think a lot of work for people like us and turnaround would come from private equity. And I do, I do have, uh, I've, I've been called a few times on that, but you do tend to be a bit embarrassed and want to keep it a little bit in house sometimes. Um, and it's quite, it's quite a difficult path to tread. But economically, we would be often a bit. Uh, more cost effective as well I mean I know I know and this is a little bit dated but if I go back a couple of years ago um, you know kind of one of the, the senior guys in in our space um, very good operator um, he spent um, considerable time over over nine twelve months trying to uh, trying to uh, go around private equity houses marketing what he did etc mm. he got no work out of it absolutely nothing at all Mm -hmm. which is quite you know you'd think that's really surprising um so that there has been lower hanging fruit but but i think by contrast that if you are invited in to go and help a, a private equity or a fund in one of their investments then you get the chance to display your skills um and then they're likely to say actually well we've got a problem over here and we've got a problem over uh, over there as well you know do you think you can go and take a look so actually, there's a good role with someone that you build a relationship with to perhaps be the troubleshooter across, you know, one or two funds of 10 or 12 investments that they have. Um, yeah, definitely. And um, James, what, what are the pros and cons of, of working in turnaround then for you as an individual? Well, I love it. I mean, I've loved it since the first um, since the first project I've done. Um, you know, I've done the big jobs, large syndicates, international businesses, sort of flying around the world. Um, it's nice to have some travel, um, uh, but um, but you kind of don't want to overdo it. Um, the it's highly commercial. It's very people focused. You're there, hands on, in the trenches, your sleeves rolled up. Uh, I think to do the top tables, board, strategic advice um, uh, within a business, you know, you've got to know the detail as well to earn the right to, 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 be, to be advising at that level and with, with the lender or lender syndicate or, the, or with the PE. So I think that's really critical and being able to dip in and out um, as to how you operate um, is really important. So, so you need a bedrock of really strong analysis skills, looking at things differently um, and dif differently from how the existing management team perhaps looks at it. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then trying to go on that journey that you've uh, assessed as some of the challenges that the business has got. And same same thing to to you, Phil. Uh, what would you say the pros and cons are of working to turn around? Well, yeah. I mean, I've I've often said when I've been uh, interviewed by clients, I'm not an adrenaline junkie as such. You know, I'm not going for the the boost and uh, the thrill of the, the the excitement and the exposure. But you are very exposed. Um, it's very challenging. It's like you're onboarding constantly. You, you don't get any rest there. So if if you're not into that sort of um, constant demand to be on your toes and and be alert and come up with things and uh, be prepared uh, for you know quite a lot of shocks and surprises and uh, you know after all there's usually a mess when you arrive or a big challenge. You, you, you've got to find a way to fix it. If you're not up to that and you don't want it, then it's it's probably not a career for yourself. But Having said that, I'm, I'm just as nervous as anybody when I start. You know, I just think, what, what have I done this for? Um, so, you know, everybody has uh, an element of the self-confidence where they're saying, well, am I, am I going to fail this time? You know, it's like being an actor, I suppose, on stage. It's uh, very good. And every time it's new, 
uh, when when you're up on that stage. So you are very exposed. Um, I, I I find that both uh, a bit nervy, but I I really enjoy the satisfaction of coming through and finding a way through the the problem, resolving it, and getting it to the client satisfaction. I think that's the biggest buzz. Um, I'd say the money can be um, better than a, a, a steady job so long as you're in work. Um, I think it's more lucrative, but I don't do it as much for the money as such. Um, the, the con side is, of course, you can have fallow periods and not know when your next assignment is. So um, it's a good idea to have some uh, money deposited in the bank just in case, just in case you're a bit nervous there. Thanks, I, Alan. I, um, can I just pick up on one of the comments there that uh, Phil made? I mean, we spoke yesterday, Phil and I, and um, mm -hmm. Phil expressed this point about sort of, you know, being uh, sort of apprehensive or nervous about kind of, well, am I going to know what the answer is to kind of this one? Um, I, 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 he asked me that question and I, I've, I've not really thought about it like that. It's because mm. there are people around you, you know, you've got the other board members, the CEO, um, then you've got also your um, extended personal network. So you've got the opportunity mm. to identify an issue and then to, to bring in, uh, and I've got, contacts in the accountancy firm restructuring team so you can then you can bring in the firepower if it's kind of necessary or you can you can sound someone out and you can get some ideas or you can go to other people in the IFT type network and say well look you know what do you think mm. yeah it's a good point and Phil what um, I mean what, what would you say the advantages are then of bringing in someone like yourself as opposed to you know maybe just Getting getting a, an FD who would have, you know be able to have a look at this. You know what what, was, what would you say the experience is that you bring to to an, um, a situation? Well, time and time again, uh, Phil, I see that uh, you know FDs with all respect, uh, being incumbent, the longer you are incumbent, the less objectivity you have and the more vested interest you have, and even given our great abilities in independence as finance people and objectivity and i think we're high up the scale there you do lose it and um if you're within the the company coming from outside you can be objective you can be dispassionate you don't have vested interests you can call a spade a spade you can be often brought in as the hard guy you know in, in um, the current situation i'm in you know they said well you know you'll be the tough guy and we'll we'll do this sort of thing and so it, it doesn't matter to me so long as we reach the objectives so um you know there's a lot of um good reasons to bring someone in from outside often i think uh, clients worry about either the expense or the disruption but you know, we are we are professionals in what we do. We have a track record of actually what what tends to happen is you bring the management team more together than than the opposite. But certainly that's my experience. And uh, I think that's always been the case that, you know, from what I can see and what I've been told, uh, leave the place in a better position than uh, certainly when uh, I came. And who would you typically typically report to um, when you're in a turnaround situation uh, again it depends on the um politics and the structure of the business so i've reported recently to a chair of um, um but the investors were um very uh, that's alchemy partners extremely interested so i have both on the phone at different times the bank can often be not the people you report into but i am increasingly of the mind that you need to be thinking that the bank behind everything is the ones that you want to be um, making sure are happy the most because they pull the purse strings and especially where you've got a financial situation um, uh, that is important or critical you've really got to do it the way the banks want so sometimes there's almost like a hidden client um, that you're not reporting to, but you are really, if that makes sense to you, to you James, what I'm trying to say there. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, so, so you've got you've got a, a, a bundle of key customers, and and often the CEO is there in the middle. Sometimes you're reporting to the CEO, sometimes the you know the the the, the, the investors or the board, PE company, the PE house have asked you, and that can make the CEO feel very threatened. So you have to be conscious of you know how you are liaising with and reporting to all the all the key stakeholders in the business. They all need something different from you, and you have to be prepared to face each one very directly if necessary, and 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 say it as it is, but also be very diplomatic because they all they all have different needs. Thanks, Phil. And um, James, what would you say are the main causes then that result in a turnaround situation? Um, so. Um if we start with a, a default, so establishing whether there's a default or not with, uh, with lenders, um, then um, that's, uh, that's key. Um, then I think you then move to, um, uh, have we run out of money? Um, uh, are we about to run out of money? Have, uh, uh, are we forecasting a covenant breach um, over the short term, but possibly even through the next six to nine months? Um, those are those are kind of hard triggers. Uh, I think uh, you then kind of go into um, other things that sort of precipitate situations, such as missed statutory financial filings. Uh, for example, I was working on a company, Pure Circle, this UK listed one, um, Bermudan parent failed to file its accounts within four months. That was because they had issues internally around revenue recognition um, and inventory, um, uh, but it was uh, it was a a sort of hole in inventory that kind of first hit the hit the headlines. It, it, it then resulted in you know forensics uh, getting involved. Um, KPMG restructuring team were already involved at the client, so um, uh, you know these are. There's, a, there's a, com a combination of things, but I think what's key is you have to, you have to then step back, um, be able to assess the situation. You've got to try and um, get short-term stability with the, all the stakeholders, for the business and all of the stakeholders, um, and, and, and do that through a short-term cash flow tool uh, and providing regular updates. Uh, and that gives you a platform for well, what is happening uh, and what, what do we need to do to fix these things? And what does it look like over the next six to nine months before you start getting out into longer term, you know, perhaps two year refinancing money? And um, yeah, I know we spoke, uh, James, about this yesterday, about um, that, that initial assessment, um, going in there, making an initial assessment. Tell me, through, through that and how long do you give yourself to make that assessment? So I always sort of task myself as, um, you know, the first day I, I want to walk away with a view of the business and the situation. Um, is there a viable business here? Um, is the business model still current or have things moved on? I mean, online in retail is a, an obvious example, but there's many other examples, you know, publishing, for example, and moving from hard copy to digital, the music industry, you know, moving to, to away from DVDs to, you know, these are just, just some examples. Uh, so, um, I think um, if there, it may be that there's a viable business but not in that form. So um, you need to look at parts of the business that may be underperforming and absorbing cash. Um, so what are you gonna do with those? Uh, can you fix it? Um, uh, can, you, um, uh, can, you, can you sell it as an exit? Or um, do you wanna just shut it down? Um, so, those are those are options that you've got at play. Yeah, I think often as well, James. We we need to buy time, don't we, for the for the client company. Um, so 
using working capital, um, pulling on whatever strings you've got available to buy yourself time for the more medium term um, strategy is always uh, vital too. So if you've got to dispose of a business, often you need a lot more time. Yeah, sure. So, so day one, I'd like to, I like to try and walk away with a view. Um, uh, um, and then day two, I'd be looking to try and get some more evidence and a bit more analysis under certain and get under the skin a bit a bit to kind of get some corroboration. It might be then that during day two or after day two, you maybe need to get back to the lender, for example, let's say the lender's influenced actually why you're there, uh, because they're rapidly going to want some, some feedback on, well, what's your assessment, initial assessment? Obviously, you have to use the right caveating. You'd be looking to run it past the CEO, the CFO, and you know, kind of get the story straight. You don't want to go out, um, uh, you, want to, you want to try and create a holding position, really, and then say, uh, and this is, this is kind of the direction of travel now over the next few days, and this is the time frame that we're going to come, I'm going to come back to you and give you some better, you know, uh, uh, some, further, some further perspectives on things and what we need to do and what the plan is. So to Phil's point about you know, buying yourself some time. And I think the reason it's so important though to form your own view very rapidly as a hypothesis and then try and sort of support it or not and change your kind of view is because if the business model is just screwed and the business is just rapidly gonna head into insolvency and fall over, you've then gonna be having that conversation, not sitting there for, you know, a week and a half, two weeks, and then sticking up your hand and then saying to the lender and to management, actually, well, you know, it's game over, guys. You know, I can't see where you can go. That's not a conversation you want to be having because actually all you're doing is creating more cost of you being there. Thanks, James. And, and Phil, what about you? How, how, how long do, do you generally take to make an initial assessment? What's, what, what's your approach? Well, yeah, it's an interesting one. The, the, there's parallels with how we actually meet people. I'm told that within seconds, you actually make all kinds of judgments about a person. And then you spend all the rest of the time, either in interviews or conversation, validating what your first prejudices were. So, um, <laughs> and I, I, think, I think there's an element of that when you go into a client, you immediately get a smell and a taste of it everything you see you know your, your senses are working over time as XTC wants to put it uh, you're looking at everything so I'd agree with James that within a day or two you get in an overall uh, opinion you know which is a prejudice because there's you know you don't have a lot of data at hand but you will have information too and you know usually you're not far off and then it's a question of whether certain things slot in a week or two later, little, little gems which you didn't first know about and which are dropped in, and then you add those to the mix. But yeah, the, the, you, you are there to, to work things out quickly. So it's really in your interest to be quite Pareto about, about this and, and, and tell the client uh, how you see it. I mean, I've just seen the group CEO this morning on a business and he's immediately saying right what what's the new MD like where you are what's what's the management team you know we do a run through I was there to do a bit of a presentation but you know they want to know all these things they want to know what your initial assessments are and they trust you and uh, you know these things are um, you know a very um, privileged area to be in and um, you have to be good at sussing things out pretty quickly which is a a combination of experience and also um, certain characteristics that you probably uh, need as a, as a turnaround person. And so I, think, I, think, I think being asked about a, a key management person, senior exec, what, what's your view? You know, that's a really, that's a really kind of difficult question um, because y you probably don't have the evidence. I say so it is, it is sharing your kind of initial thoughts or gut feel mm -hmm. about somebody um but um you know so you've got to be you've got to be really careful and, and phil what, what what are the 
the sort of remedies that you, um, you that you come up with. What are the, what are the quick wins that uh, that you've uh, done? Uh, well, I, th I, th I think um, a common thread there, Phil, is steady the ship. You know, because at the time when we're asked to come in, there is something wrong. Let's face it. You know, it's a it's an extra big overhead as far as the guys are concerned. They're bringing in someone new. They don't know them often unless you uh, they're on repeat business. Um, there's a lot of risk in bringing another person in. So you have to be pretty quick at steadying the ship often it can be a problem in the finance department it could be the it's often the leader so you need to steady them and um they're either on the way out or you need to work with work alongside them whatever it is um it's really important that in the last role i did one of the first things uh, I got wind of was the controller was writing one-to-ones with uh, the boss to say, you know, I'm pretty much had enough. But well, within 24 hours, uh, I, I let the CEO know that that was vital. that We kept that FC at all points and they were asking why they weren't in a bonus scheme. And the CEO said, oh, well, you know, they're not, they're not in one. The, the people who are uh, have, have a right to it. And there's this reason and that reason. So, I got straight on to the investor and within 24 hours, the guy was in a bonus scheme and he was retained. So, you know, sometimes you have to do that triangulation between the different stakeholders. They may not always have the same view. And um, it's really important to make sure that you have the people with you, uh, either psychologically or just physically, and don't want to leave um, because it's much worse if... You know, you're brought in as a turnaround and everybody's key people start exiting and then you've got a bill that's rocketing up and up and up if you're having to bring other uh, resources in too. So, so steady in the ship is really, really important. And um, because of your initial assessment, sometimes you can find some quick wins and through your network or different, different solutions as to, to, to ways in which the, the, the company can do better. And as I say, always always use working capital management uh, cash flow has got to be essential it's incredible james isn't it how how few clients have a decent 13 week 52 week cash flow and they just don't know where they are and it's the first thing you do yeah um it, absolutely phil i mean i can't uh, over all of the time i've worked in this space i i almost can't think of a single company that does best in class, you know, practice around mm. short term cash flows at 13. Uh, I like to actually try and once you've got a, a four to eight week view and then develop it to the 13 mm. as quickly as you can, but then actually to try and make it, uh, make it like a 20 week cash flow. Yeah. Yeah. 13 yeah. weeks isn't kind of long enough before you go two weeks forward, you know, you're down to 11 weeks and you've got to go through a process yeah. of trying to update month three. So it's much yeah. better to try and, go out, uh, say, 20 weeks or to the next half year point, and it kind of gives you that granular, uh, granular aspect. Yeah. Uh, but but baselining, baselining a cash flow against which you can, um, uh, against you can manage the situation and the board and the external stakeholders, you know, is, uh, is invaluable because you then are back into rebuilding confidence with the stakeholders and that this is a management team that knows what it's doing and it's and it's hitting its cash forecast and you've kind of gone from an old world environment which was probably a, a, a nasty surprise came along um, to um, a, a no surprises approach and we're now in a new world with you know a CRO or turnaround turnaround expertise at the table to 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 oversee all of that. Mm -hmm. And James, um, to you, any any sort of quick wins that uh, any other quick wins that you deploy? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think I think I think having that baseline cash flow gives you um, because you haven't been in the business long enough you won't be able to factor in working capital improvements and cost reduction improvements, but um, you can then pursue some of those things. Working capital is the, 
the biggest area to kind of go for first? Well, first, firstly, you can put CapEx on hold or to absolutely essential only. Um, uh, looking at labor costs and trying to take out overtime costs um, by um, having a, it's got to be specifically approved in advance, for example, uh, trying to do anything around any um, contract labor that you might be able to reduce short term. Um, uh, then you've got the HMRC lever that you can pull, if I kind of um, refer to it as that. So what can you what can you do to stretch the HMRC position in order to perhaps be helping the company to survive? Um, uh, because you can, as you get your plan in place, then you can engage with HMRC. You might fall behind uh, on the next month's payment on VAT or on, but more likely on the PAYE side of things. Uh, or corporation tax, um, but but certainly PAYE, uh, and then then you can go back to the table once you've kind of got a forecast in place and a plan to then engage with them, either on an informal arrangement or perhaps a time to pay, or just to communicate how you're going to catch up. So those are some things, um, and then um, you've got creditor management. So on the creditor side, there's lots of things that you can do. Um, with suppliers around sort of trying to stretch creditors um, and have it on this sort of, you know, just on the right side of the line of um, of, of, of sort of max, maxing out trade creditor stretch, but without putting the business at risk. There's lots of things that you have to consider in there because um, you can get far too many people calling into the finance team, then finance can't cope. So but you can settle the small ones, a bunch of small ones, take a load of noise out of the system. Also local suppliers, perhaps, depending on the kind of profile of the business, because you, know, you don't want the market or local suppliers thinking, well, I'm not getting paid, I'm not getting paid, I'm not getting paid, what's going on? And then suppliers getting put on stop, et cetera. So there's lots of factors to consider around tactical cash management. Yeah, everything's up for grabs, isn't it, James? I mean, you shouldn't take anything for, for, for normal once you're in that situation. And the best thing to do is once you've got a plan, talk with the creditors, talk with the um, people who you owe money to, um, because um, th them knowing is, is, is half the battle. What they don't like is not knowing. I mean, we, we, I even had a situation where we made about four or five million cash flow by actually saying to creditors, we're going to pay you on time for the first time in six years. You're going to be paid on time, but we are going to renegotiate our terms. You know, it's 60, 90 days, I'm often 30, 60. And we made five million out of it, but they did not believe that we were going to pay them on time. We said, no, you're going to be paid on time now. And um, it was hard for the first month. Uh, we we did that and they said, oh, you'll just go back to your old ways. But this, they saw after two or three months, we meant it and we got a much better relationship and much better supply chain. So how, how important is communication then um, when you're in a, a turnaround situation, Phil? Absolutely crucial. And, you know, I think this is it. You, you know, we, we, we're left with very few resources to play with. Um, but this is the time not to be on the fiddle or be duplicitous. You know, you obviously when you're going through restructurings and difficult times, there's certain things you can't say to certain people. Um, and you have to be, you know, very careful uh, and, and, and quite secret, sometimes quite private, but actually in your relationships with both your board and third parties, you, you've got to show your integrity and, um, that, that stands for a lot. And if you do muck up and you have to go back, I mean, um, because the, the cash flow has worsened, then tell, tell the creditor, don't try and hide. You know, the, you're always best to talk, talk to them and, and thrash it out. Because I don't know about you, James, but I've found, you know, solutions come through that. And they'd rather you talk to them than, than try and hide. Yeah, at the end of the day, the objective is to make sure that everyone gets paid the debt that's owed. Mm. Um, uh, 
And uh, if that's going to take time and it's going to take a bit longer and mm. other things happen between how you've first sort of tried to realistically manage those expectations, mm. if you find yourself in a, in a tougher place because um, the business is still in, not moved forward um, uh, enough in the positive direction, um, uh, then you, you've got you've to gotta, you've gotta address it. You know, you've got to you've, you've got to be uh, you've got to be as open as you can. But absolutely, what Phil said is you've got to be smart around the information that you do share and you don't share, mm. and that particularly applies with um, with your lender or your lender group. Yeah. Um, the worst thing you can do is try and be too transparent with a lender. Uh, and start giving them lots of information because what banks do yeah. is whenever you give them a piece of information then the case manager wants to understand how it related to the last information and how did you go from there <laughs> to there so you create a rod for your own back yeah. every piece of information that you're giving them mm -hmm. uh, and that's why you need to be open in your messaging and what's happening uh, and what the plan is and how it's being driven forward and progress updates. Keep giving them the short term cash flow that shows, you know what, well, we gave you that one first. That was the first time it had ever been produced. Um, mm. You roll it forward a couple of weeks and, and, and it's fine um, or it's not fine. We've refined it now. Mm. Uh, and, and then you manage to that or, or beat it. Then they've yeah. got that confidence. And, and they'll get that confidence, James, from seeing, because they'll check everything, as you say, that you give them, and they'll have a, a couple of analysts working on it as well, to, whose job is just to come up with irritating questions um, for you and tie you up even more. So you're absolutely right. That, but once they keep checking and monitoring and realise that you're on top of your numbers and that you now coming in are not making mistakes and f not failing to give them information, the trust builds up, but as you say, don't give them the info and the plans until you're ready. So I'd add to that, make sure the management team is all aligned with the plans and the forecast that you're giving them. And once they are, then you're in a good position once you've uh, financially set it out, then away you go. On the, on the last job that I just did, um, uh, uh, where I was out in, uh, based out of Malaysia, um, there was uh, seven banks in the syndicate, uh, you know, it was over a hundred million dollars was the exposure. Um, and um, uh, I knew that they would want feedback from me sort of like, you know, really rapidly. What I did was I set up uh, a call with each of the three COCOM banks, steering, steering group banks, as a one-to-one as a -one -one session. I probably had three or four from each institution on there, but mm -hmm. the call was not for me to give them views on the business it was for me to hear all their gripes about management because I was coming at this as a as a fresh pair of eyes I wanted to hear their issues nothing surprised me in what any of them said and they were remarkably similar conversations but you're going through a process where they feel that their issues have been heard and this was lenders that had been uh, kept starved of information for two months didn't know if the business was going to run out of cash, didn't know if they were going to get their $5 million amortization payment in six weeks time. So, uh, so you know, we, you have to kind of go through all this process type approach uh, and it's invaluable because you're understanding what their hot buttons are. And exactly. you use that as part of formulating your plan and then sitting down with the CEO or the CFO the board and saying right you know this is what i've heard and what do you think and and then you're you're then immediately into providing leadership direction uh, and bringing your experience to the table just um conscious of time we'll, we'll move uh soon to the questions from the audience just as a reminder if anyone does want to put a question to the panel if you use the chat box uh, facility um, make sure you, you pop it in there. Um, I think one or two emails have come through, but I can't access them. Um, so any questions in the chat box facility? Um, so um, I'll put this one to Phil. If um, some of the quick quick wins um, are unsuccessful, what other solutions are, are out there? 
if they're unsuccessful right okay well <laughs> I, I i worked a couple of clients back with um uh, what one business which just could not pay its bills i mean it was not quite technically insolvent but you know we're almost there and i think the first thing i'd say is um you'd be amazed just how much you can stretch your creditors if you really um uh uh, struggling, struggling, and and also, I wouldn't be afraid to um, put your own case once you uh, say you've got your management plan as to how things are going to be. Because there's nothing a bank likes more than seeing a plan out of the mess, yeah, and that can give them more um, confidence that you know you're doing your, the right thing and give buy you more time. I mean, we did, we were taking. Uh, down to our bank in London to see them for what was going to be a stripping down and the owner the owner managed business said look just leave it to me I'm going to do all the talking because he was really good at the gift of the gab well within five minutes he was torn to strips by the um, the the leader of the bank who he knew very well and was on very good terms with but he completely annihilated him so I just said well uh, let me take over and I did a bit of a Churchillian speech but very much um, uh, anchored in uh, numbers and basically said we are presenting numbers which are underestimating the uh, profit because we're using very prudent accounting assumptions and threw a few things in there and basically said uh, underlying it's a lot better than it is and here's the management plans and this is how we're going to get out of it and uh, an hour later we were all leaving the premises we're slapping each other on the backs and um uh, had six months grace more from the, from the bank to find a solution to the difficulties. So, you know, you, I, I'd say never give up is is one of the things that you think you think you're running out of rope, but it's amazing what you can can pull on. You know, never say never. James, what what about you? What uh, if if the the obvious solutions or the quick wins aren't producing goods? Then what other solutions are out there? Um, sorry, I, 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 what was the, just read the quick question for me because I was just scanning the uh, panellists' questions. Okay, um, no when, problem. Uh, when you started. Um, if the quick wins don't seem to work, what other solutions are, are out there? Oh um, uh, yeah, sure. So, um, so I think, well, number one, uh, money can always keep the situation going for longer um, uh, whilst you try to look at um, options. Um, it's always in a stress distress situation easier to work with the existing stakeholders than it is to bring a, a new stakeholder and a new funder um, into into the party because you know why does somebody else want to take on someone else's dirty washing so to speak unless there's going to be a, a kind of significant equity return or there's a sort of consolidation aspect in a in a space and you can take out a load of costs, central costs. So money, um, uh, you've got um, considering um, a sale, if you want to put the business out um, on the market as a accelerated M&A, as it's referred to in the trade, um, or dist distressed M&A, it's termed accelerated M&A because if you're actually trying to sell a business, warts and all, what you want to try and do is to kind of present it in its best possible light. Um, but it's all about speed of M&A transaction that you're trying to do, which might be uh, you know, four to six weeks rather than a more typical M&A process might take three to six months, for example. That will go to value um, because um, people doing their diligence worth their salt are going to uncover some of the issues they might not uncover all of them um, uh, so that's an option um, very topical at the moment uh, with landlords um, uh, you've got um, uh, CVAs being used you know retail casual dining uh, are, are, are classic sectors for use of CVAs a CVA is a, a form of insolvency process um, or restructuring process, which is to, to try and buy some time and some breathing space. It's 
but it's predicated on everyone's going to get repaid in full. Um, uh, uh, we just need some time. So what we'll do is we will make arrangements with key creditors like HMRC, our trade creditors, our landlords, and we'll put them all in the pot and we'll, we'll come up with a plan and present a, a plan in the form of a CBA for creditors to vote and support of. Obviously, creditors can look at that and they can look at, well, what's their other option? Uh, sorry, you'd also have the, the, the bank or banks would, would be in there as financial creditors. Um, I was, I'm just conscious of the of time and saving a little bit of, uh, to, to uh, the audience questions. So one final question. Go, go on, Phil. Yeah, saying some great questions there. So I think we're going to have to race through. So there's some really great questions to answer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well one final question that I'll, I'll put to you, Phil. If um, I know some people are hesitant on bringing someone like yourself in because they think that's extra cost, but obviously um, you can save them quite a bit. What what advice would you have to a a business owner who is thinking of bringing someone in um, to help with the situation like yourself or James? Well, I'd say don't hesitate. I mean, it's day 12 of uh, an assignment I'm doing now and I've just presented to the group CEO that I'm half a million ahead of the targets he presented to the board. So paid, paid back in two weeks, you know, uh, tenfold. So, you know, it's, you just, once you've chosen, you've selected uh, the person, which can sometimes be through headhunters like yourself or, or, or your own network or banks, then, then get on with it. I mean, and the quicker you do it, if you do make a mistake or the interim just is the, not the right interim for you, you, you've still got other choices there. You know, there's experts at hand like yourselves and uh, networks to, to find the right person, but um, you inevitably, you know, I've I've always added value. I'm glad to say, and uh, you know, he, heaps and heaps. Uh, I think uh, the Institute for Turnarounds recently did a survey um, through through us, James. I can't remember the exact um, number, but I think it's estimated that two billion of added value has come through the whole of the institute over a period of time through the work that they did. If you tried to quantify it. Good. Okay, right. I'm going to uh, ask you to, do, we're going to have to do 30 seconds of question here. So first one to James. In a big four restructuring team, uh, what percentage of firms get transformed uh, versus wound up? Oh, um, I, I couldn't say, to be honest. Um, I think, um, however, at the moment, we're in exceptional circumstances of COVID. You're seeing retailers and uh, casual di dining, uh, you know, just being pushed over the edge. And so you're seeing, uh, and, and then in automotive, for example, and the automotive supply chain, um, uh, you know, uh, businesses that just haven't got, haven't got a way out other than really perhaps finding a new buyer um, if, you, if, if, if somebody might, might want, want, want to purchase it. I think... I think historically there was a, um, uh, you know, it would it would take time for a situation to kind of go through. I think SME SME businesses have always been prone to going straight from a, a problem, catastrophic problem has happened with the business, and then it kind of falls suddenly into insolvency. Uh, larger businesses usually the, the governance in the in the country. Um, or in the UK and wider has now been for a, a couple of decades advanced with HICS and non-execs etc etc that you rarely see a big situation just kind of collapse you know in in days. Um, I'm going to throw another question out there is, is there a specific cash flow software that you've come across um, that you regularly go back to for each assignment? Any particular software that you use? Phil, should I play that one? <laughs> yeah, sure, I just use Excel because there isn't the time to start setting up systems. So cool. Yeah, I concur with that. And, right. um, and, cool. and basically, um, it needs to be bespoke to the business um, and, and, and you, wanna, you wanna format it in a particular way. Um, uh, but essentially, you're kind of going down the key cost categories 
um, your capex, your, your, your financing costs, etc. You need to build it bespoke. And actually, it's an invaluable thing to do. Yeah. Uh, as soon as you've done your sort of rapid assessment type thing, mm -hmm. um, it's the first thing you need to do because it gives you the understanding of what's going through the business. What are the revenue streams? What are the drivers of those revenue streams? What, what, what are they expecting? Exactly. Um, and understand the cost base. Yeah. Get, get so you down. The get you down. Sorry. I was just going to say, get the downloads from the system that are correct and then, and then bespoke, bespoke it. You, you get to your answer much more quickly and you get on top of your numbers. Okay, so uh, we'll, we we'll go with Excel for that one. I'm going to move it on to the next. Where you are. Sorry, you need to understand where you are with the creditors and what your arrears are and how they're going to unwind. So you, you start it with, well, what's your opening cash position sort of today or at the end of last week? And, and you get your ledger reports and you unwind your debtors, you unwind your creditors, uh, uh, and then you factor in what's your trading forecast and what's the time lags to cash flows. Mm -hmm. uh, another question, uh, do you see there's opportunity for um, PE firms that offer restructuring finance like better capital in the current climate? Do you think they're gonna be doing well? Phil, I'll go over yeah, to you. Well. <laughs> um, I mean, I've, I've just uh, finished uh, a, an expansion facility with Oak North for £56 million pounds for a pub chain that was locked down. So, you know, um, there's, there's opportunity for ev everything. And I think the, 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 the bank has to, and the, P, uh, the PE firms have to have confidence in the management, first of all, and the business model. And, and be able to see through where where we are now and, and say when we come out of this where where do we expect that business to be so yeah okay I, we've got a few questions there but we we're pretty much coming up to time on, on that one so um if anyone does want to reach out to, to to either of you um would it be fair to say yeah they can connect sure. with you on linkedin and, and maybe if no you've got any particular questions um, that they weren't answered, that they could do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no worries, no worries. And great questions as well. Yeah, sorry we've not been able to get through all of them, but uh, no, there's no problem there. Just as a final takeaway, um, I'd like to just um, leave people in the audience with the thought about, you know, if there's a situation that needs new money, maybe you're a stakeholder, financial stakeholder, maybe... Uh, maybe it's it's more about you know do I don't I how much um, uh, but maybe you're not up for it and maybe the business because of that situation is uh, is then a high risk of um, of an insolvency scenario um, uh, well the likes of Phil and myself you know we've got contacts through our personal network we we can bring alternative lenders and finance into the equation and I think that's a real differentiator compared with uh, quite a lot of people that um, uh, put themselves out as, as, as turnaround restructuring professionals. If you can bring pound notes to the table um, to help a situation, um, you know, may, many people can't, can't, can't tap into that. Great guys, thank you very much for, for your insights. Um, a big, a big thank you to to everyone for for tuning in and and listening. Um, mm. It pr pretty much um, brings us up. Um, I will put some uh, posts on on LinkedIn and tag both Phil and um, also I'll um, I'll tag James into that. So uh, if anyone um, has enjoyed the event, please put a comment in there. Um, and also, if you do need Phil or James's details, you'll find that from the LinkedIn post. So okay. I'll email that to everyone through Eventbrite. But um, thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. And um, yeah. I'll formally bring this session to a close. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.